Okay, last week we looked at fear of the Lord. And remember, I ended it on that Jesus' delight was in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is truly a delightful thing. It's not a horrible and hard thing. It is a wonderful beginning place, and it is profound respect and love. God wants us to profoundly love and respect him as he is. And in Jesus, we get to see, never forget, he was a man. He was fully God, but he was fully man. In Jesus, we get to see how a perfect human being lived and navigated an imperfect world perfectly. (laughs) Did you get all those perfects? Um, And so maybe we should learn from his life. How did he do it? What characterized him? In Jesus, we see all the commands of the Old Testament lived out in a human being, which is something nobody else has ever done before and will never do again because he had no sin nature. He was the only person that was ever able to do this, and it was natural and free to him because he walked in perfection with God. Again, something that none of us will ever do, but we get to see a person who it wasn't burdensome to him. It was just who he was. And in this life, he's trying to get us to the place, not to follow the Old Testament, I don't mean that, but to get us to the place where we are so full of him and so have let him just help us to destroy the sin nature that lives in us with his help so that we can live free the way he wants us to. It's never to hurt us. It is to bring us life. His commands bring us life. He lived in abundance. He lived in love. And he lived in joy and peace. And he's promised to give us that same abundance while we're here. Is that your reality? And you just have to ask yourself this. Do I live in love and joy and peace? Are those some things that characterize my life? I'm not teaching anything to hurt us ever or to make us feel guilty. However, if Jesus' words did not sting a little bit while he was down here, I don't think anybody would have killed him. Because Jesus never did anything wrong, but he told the truth. And sometimes, you remember Jack Nicholson? You can't handle the truth. (laughs) I mean, sometimes that's just us. It's really hard for us to handle the truth. But remember what he said. What will truth ultimately do? It will set us free. He wants us to be free. He longs for us to be free. The one abundant trait of a person who's living in self-forgetfulness or humility, the the overwhelming thing that they will that will characterize their life is joy. I believe that if we could just forget about ourselves for 5 minutes, we'd be like, "Oh, this is great." But it'd come crashing back in. Um, Do you want to live a joyful life? Humility is the absolute key. And Jesus is our perfect man who lived a perfect life in an imperfect world. How did he do it? Philippians 2 is my favorite group of scriptures, 1 through 7. It's probably my favorite in the the entire word of God. So I'm going to read it. And this is Jesus. I've read it before when I've done Sunday morning teachings. It's utterly incredible that this is God. When he came to the earth, that God did what he did. Jesus was God, just like God's God. And this is the way he lived his life. It says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participate in, participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And listen to what he says. This is Paul speaking through Philippians. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, which is pride. Conceit is pride. Do nothing from selfish ambition or pride. (laughs) How many of us can say that for a full day ever? (laughs) I mean, isn't it just hard not to say, well, I went down to the soup kitchen and helped feed the hungry. That's why I got up at 3.30 this morning. A little tired, but it was a blessing. Led five people to the Lord. No big deal. I mean, it's just natural. We just love it. So do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. I've kind of got this memorized because I'm like, just don't do it. You know, because I want to say, I do. 
Does anybody else struggle with that besides me? Okay, we just do it. It says, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Mm, That one's easy too, isn't it? They're more significant than me. Yes, I embrace that. These are just, it's crazy. It said, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Mm, This is just character. I'm feeling good about myself. How about (laughs) y'all? Let's just go home. We got this. Nobody even needs this teaching. Oh, yes. I know. One day, who was it? Somebody here, I think it was Angela Keener. She said, you passed by me and didn't let me out. And I'm like, I usually do, always. I just didn't that one time. I'm not as nice as you think I am. (laughs) She said, I saw you. Your back tail light's out. And I'm like, oh, it's because you weren't in front of me because I didn't let you out. But... (laughs) Yes. Okay. It's just the truth. It's just the truth. Humiliating. Because what do you do? You did it. Okay. And he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So he tells us to have this kind of mind and it is ours in Christ Jesus. Like he has put this in us. So it's not like we can't do it. Let's believe it. We can do this. Okay. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. And that grasp, that word means to seize, especially by an open display of force. So he was equal with God, and he didn't count it as something to be seized and and be forceful. Because you think about it, in the garden, he said, don't you know I could call thousands of angels down right now if I wanted to? Can y'all imagine if we had that kind of power? Can you imagine going down the road and somebody's hateful? He's like, <laughs> I mean, we would be so dangerous with that kind of power, but he wasn't. I mean, he didn't consider equality with God something he was going to come down here and push his way around. He didn't do it at all. He really didn't. But he emptied, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That word emptied means without recognition, perceived as valueless. Is that not our worst fear? Is that not when we get upset, when we feel like we're perceived as having no value, whether we're in our home or in our work or wherever, that hurts us worse than anything. And he emptied himself so that he could be perceived as valueless. But they have plucked out his beard and used a scourge on his back if they thought he was valuable. No. And being found in human form, he, Jesus, humbled himself. Did God have to humble Jesus? No. Jesus humbled himself by becoming becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because all that's true, because he humbled himself. And I always think about that with myself when I want to be puffed up and proud I think, who do I think I am? The Son of God humbled himself and became nothing. And he had joy. I want to be that way. It's my desire to be that way. But we get in our own way. But but like I said, we want to look at this and go, God, you've given me this mind. I want to be this way. So because of all that, it said, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. And that's just the truth. God tells us if we'll humble ourselves, if we'll do this, he says, I will exalt you. He did it for Jesus, and he will do it for us. And we'll talk a little more about that later. The definition of true humility is it seeks to bring glory and honor to God and looks out for the interests of others. That's what biblical humility is. Seeks to bring glory and honor to God And looks out for others. Does that not sound like loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And loving your neighbor as yourself. I mean, humility is just wrapped up in that. Jesus has put that mind inside of us. We have the ability to humble ourselves. God longs for us to do this because he doesn't want to humble us. God does not get any pleasure out of humbling us. But he will. Because he will finish what he started. 
He who began a good work in us will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Even if we change our minds, <laughs> we're in. We're his child. So he is going to finish what he started. So he came and he showed us exactly what to do in hopes that we'll listen and do it. Our old way of thinking does not have to define us. He can change our minds. Will humbling ourselves stop suffering in our lives? Does anybody have the um, answer to that? It will, will humbling ourselves just stop suffering? Absolutely not. Jesus humbled himself and Jesus never sinned. He walked perfectly and listened to what Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 says. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who, who obey him. And it says Jesus was made perfect through suffering. Was Jesus perfect before he suffered? Yes. Jesus was not the perfect sacrifice for me and you until he went through everything me and you go through. He, he had to be tempted in every way. Everything that happens to us had to happen to Jesus or he would have not been the perfect sacrifice. He had to live a certain amount of time, go through what humans go through, and then he was the perfect sacrifice for us because now he's a merciful high priest. Can you imagine? God had never been a man before. And us down here, here in our weaknesses, sometimes I just wonder, did he, does he go, Father, it is really hard down there. <laughs> Have some mercy on them. <laughs> I know what it's like down there. It's Because God did not know what it was like to live down here. He does now. And he has mercy for us. That's why he says, come to me, let me help you. I know how hard it is on that earth. He knows how it is for friends to betray him. He knows how it is to be rejected for no reason. He knows, he knows all the things. So... It, it won't keep us from suffering, but humility will guarantee that not one ounce of our suffering will be wasted. I want you to hear that. Humility, when we humble ourselves, submit to God in the middle of our suffering, we're going to suffer down here. That's just life. But it will guarantee that God will use every single bit of it. Nothing will be wasted in our suffering. Because it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us. Troubles achieve something for us that we cannot achieve on our own. It says it will achieve for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. <clears throat> so whatever suffering we're going through, and there's some pretty deep suffering down here. He says what I'm doing through that will far outweigh the suffering that you're going through. God's perfect, his ways are perfect, and they're more effective than the best surgeon in the world. His scalpel is sharp and always targeted so he can deliver us from pride with as little pain as possible. God is not unduly harsh, ever. He's just not. I have to remind myself of these things as I suffer and as I go through seasons of humbling or even humiliation, I've had both. I've humbled myself. And there's times where I've had to go into humiliation from God's hand. Alice talked about that. And we want to think God would never do that. He's trying to help us. He's trying to save Terry from Terry. Terry teaches a lot of people. He doesn't want my proud butt up here teaching y'all. He wants me to be humble so that I can teach you. So I have to remind myself God's goal is to make me like his son. Remember that. What's God's goal for us? It is to make us like Jesus. It's not to give us this happy, healthy life. That may be what happens to us. It may not be, but his goal is to make us like Jesus. That's what he wants to do, conform us to the image of his son. He's good. And I will say that probably every week. God is good through and through. His plans are good. The way he deals with us is good. It may not feel good, but it's good. He loves us perfectly. He loves me perfectly. He loves you perfectly. He's not mad at us. Isn't it easy to get in that whole thing of God's mad at me? God is not mad at us. You have to get that in your mind. He is not mad at you. That's not the way he treats you. He's your father. He puts us in situations to help us, but he's not up there just angry. He, is, he knows we don't know any better. When he was on the cross, he said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They had a rigged up... Um, trial. Did they know they were crucifying an innocent man? Yes. But did they really know what they were doing? None of us would do the stupid life changing, altering, destroying things we do if we really knew better. We really don't know better a lot of times. 
So, and this, whatever he's allowing is for great deliverance if I will get the right perspective. Man, perspective is everything. And if I don't look at my life through the lens of God's goodness and his love and he's working it together for good, life will eat me up. I have to ask him, and this is a big one, I have to ask him to open my eyes and heart to receive and cooperate with what he is allowing in my life. Real humbling, it hurts. I mean, we would never choose God's way of dealing with us. We would choose it to be much more pleasant, quicker, all these things. But God's ways are real and they're effective because he's going deep inside of us to make us like Jesus all the way through. And my reaction tells the truth. I want you to hear that. My reaction and your reaction tell the truth. Reaction. Reaction is what you do before you think about anything, right? So what's in you accidentally just goes, and you're like, you know, it's just the truth. So I have to look at my reactions and go, did it reveal pride, fear, hate, jealousy, insecurity? What did my reaction reveal? And our reaction can be full of faith and and kindness too. I mean, sometimes my reaction shocks me because I'm, I'm not mad or I did react in love. Sometimes I don't. I just have to realize That my reaction, however I reacted to something, is telling me what's inside of me because it's come out all of a sudden. And I have to be willing to look at my reactions. They are undeniable truth tellers about the health of my soul. And in those reactions, they can invite a conversation with God where I can say, I didn't realize I was like that. What happened? And I can have a conversation with God. It's not like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I should have never done that. I'd hate that I did. No, you go in and say, God, what's wrong? Why did I, why was that my reaction? What's going on inside of me that I'm so upset or whatever's going on that I did that so that God can help us? And in Proverbs, there are over 20 scriptures about humility. I'm only going to talk about four. And Proverbs 3.34 says, The Lord mocks the mockers, but is gracious to the humble. Proverbs 11.12 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings honor. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's Proverbs 16.18. When we humble ourselves, God gives us grace, wisdom, and honor. Did you hear those things? With humility comes wisdom. When I humble myself, God will open up my mind to understand his word. He even says, I think it's in Proverbs 2, that if you would have responded to my rebuke, I would pour my heart out to you. God says, if you would just respond to me, I will pour my heart out to you personally. That's friendship. So those are things he longs to give his children. He longs to give us grace, wisdom, and honor. Do you see why God hates pride? Because pride brings disgrace, humiliation, and destruction. What would we want our children to enjoy? Would we want them to have grace, wisdom, and honor? Or would we want them to do whatever they want and have disgrace, humiliation, and destruction? Pride is the opposite of God which means it's the opposite of everything good. And pride makes God have to do something, I believe, that totally breaks his heart. He has to humble us. And there's no joy for that in God. I mean, he will do it, but there's no joy in it for God. And I'm reading that book. I told you I read that book called Humility by Gavin Ortland, And he had a chapter about um, things to ask ourselves and to help us along this path of humility. So it was ways to cultivate humility. So I'm going to, I turn them into questions. So this may sting a little, stings me a little, but there's 10 of them. And one is the first one is, do I talk too much? Do I listen to hear or do I listen to answer? You ever talk to somebody that you're afraid to take a breath? because you know they're going to jump in and start again? Have you ever been that person? I have. Um, Proverbs 18.2 says, says, Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinion. So am I a good listener? Am I grateful? 
or entitled? Entitled says, why is this happening to me? I've done this, this, and this. Why is this bad thing happening to me? So am I grateful or am I entitled? And there's Proverbs 15, 5, because a lot of this just comes out of Proverbs. All the days of the oppressed are bad. All the days of us when we feel entitled end up being a bad day. But a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Am I grateful? I mean, grateful is a huge sign of humility. Do I get angry when I'm criticized? Rebuke a fool and he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you more. Does anybody like being criticized? And maybe corrective, uh, corrective criticism, a rebuke. Um, and, and I try to do this in my own life. I try to go, because people, people, believe it or not, y'all think everybody loves me. They don't. Um, I get criticism, and I have people criticize me or send me stuff, tell me whatever. And I, I always, my first reaction is, you're wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm 100% right all the time. And it, But then I have to go, God, are they seeing something I don't see? Even if they did it out of the wrong motive, I always try to say, is there some truth in what they said? And try to be open to God because it hurts. And try to be open to God and say, is there any truth in it? Do I enjoy life? And do I enjoy the pleasures of my body? And this may sound weird, but do I enjoy food, sex, a good laugh, a sunset? And he, he said in that book, just the simple enjoyment of life. You know, at this point in my life, I, I've told you all, I can go out and sit on the porch for 10 minutes, and to me, that's like a little vacation. I just enjoy it. I love just the days of my life, just being able to do very simple things. I, I'm not very high maintenance. But pride, especially spiritual pride, tends to be contemptuous about the pleasures of the body. Like, oh, I should never eat that, or oh, I shouldn't do this, or, you know, they just, there's this, punishment of your own body and I don't believe God wants us to do that he doesn't want us to be gluttons and all that kind of thing but he wants us to enjoy life and enjoy the gifts he's given us and a humble person can receive them as gifts from the God and do I embrace my weaknesses it's wonderfully freeing to say I'm just not very good at this do I embrace my weaknesses do I can I tell people you know, that's just not a gift I have. I'm just not good at it. Could you do this? I mean, there's so many. We would never have women's ministry if I was uh, had to do it all because I would not call y'all all the time. I would not send you lots of texts like Emily does. Um, those things are not my gifting, but they're her gifting. So I have many weaknesses. Can I laugh at myself and truly enjoy the laugh? I'm not talking about when you hate yourself or you shame yourself or I'm so stupid. I just, I'm not talking about that. Can you laugh at yourself? Um, we all do preposterous and ridiculous things sometimes. Am I right? I mean, just dumb things. And we've all got quirky parts about us. You know, I've told y'all I can't stand when you're sweaty in your armpits. So if you ever are, please don't lift your arm to me because I will have to, re I will have to reject you <laughs> and walk the other way. It's a thing I have and I hate it. Like, I don't even like to see it on TV. I have to turn the channel. I'm like, Um, I could say more things about my quirks, but y'all may never come back, so I won't. Um, but humility allows us to laugh about it um, and to be a little morbid, but not, can I accept the fact that I'll die and life will go on? I have people sometimes say, oh, I've got to do this, 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 and I, I, you've probably heard me say this. I try to look at them and go, if you get hit by a Mack truck right now, life will go on. I mean, people will miss you. I think people talk about you for three months maybe, and then you're pretty much never mentioned again. It's just a scientific fact. And I'm like, we don't need to think that all of life, I mean, how did God run the world before I got here? <laughs> I mean, some of that is just, I've got so much to do. I'm like, well, God really probably doesn't do that to us. We may do that to ourselves, and we think we're so important that everything's revolving around us, and it's miserable. And when you complain about it, people are like, <laughs> you know, you're in charge of your own schedule usually. But anyway, um, am I in awe 
of the massiveness of the universe or are my problems way bigger than God? Because I have had to in my life, because my problems have been way bigger than God in my mind, I have honestly had to go outside and just look at trees and look at the sky and go, okay, if you did all that, this is not too big for you. Because I get overwhelmed. I know everybody in here does, and you feel like you got to help God figure out how to do things. And I mean, it's just life can be so overwhelming. So I have to look at this universe and go, God spoke and made all that. And it's overwhelming how massive his world is. Do I think about heaven and what's happening there? All the heavenly beings are worshiping the one who sits on the throne and the lamb. Or am I thinking about me all day long and why no one is noticing all that I do? We do this sometimes. And then the last one was think on this. The fall of mankind with Adam and Eve was caused by pride and we lost the glory we were created in. Our return to God is caused by humility. Christ humbled himself and we have to humble ourselves to come to him. And results, when, because of humility, that results in his glory being restored in us. So humility ultimately equals glory. Even for us, God says, humble yourself, I'll lift you up. No wonder God wants to, us to humble ourselves. He longs to let us shine with his glory. He wants to. We can humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, or he can bring humiliation. Oh, how he prefers that we just cooperate with him and live. Our days are designed by God perfectly for each one of us. Every single one of us, when we get up in the morning, you are not a victim of your day. God is in charge of the day. Remember that because we forget it. It doesn't feel that way. If we would fling the door wide open to God and not self-protect, every single day would be an adventure in trust. And I'm not saying there wouldn't be super hard and horrible days. Death can come visit us, a family member, whatever. Some of you have had that happen. But every single day, God wants to turn into an adventure of trust where things happen and we say, God, I want to panic, but I'm going to open my eyes and let you show me that you're in control. Help me. And that is a good thing to do with God all day long. Does anybody ever make it 24 hours without something happening? Even if you stay home, they'll call you. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to make it 24 hours. We're not. We're just not. <sighs> So what could he do in 24 hours if we would stop fighting against his ways of perfecting us? Because that's what he's doing. Okay, and I just gave you a hypothetical here, and I wrote this down as like a prayer. Because I want you all to go home with real things that you can do, real ways that you understand the ways of God. What if we had a horrible hatred towards someone at work and were about to explode, but instead we ran to a private place and said something like this? <laughs> and this is like a prayer. And I do not know anybody named Denise at work. And what if we said, Lord, I despise Denise. Her voice grates my soul and I want to strangle her. She's prettier than me, more efficient. Her husband has a good job. He's better looking than mine. Her house is beautiful. And Larry, the boss, loves her to death. I feel small and unnoticed. I feel so insecure and scared right now. And I fear you don't notice me either. I'm a jealous wreck, and I can't help it. Please help me, Father. I know you have something so much better for me, and my crazy mind tells me otherwise. I'm humbling myself and being as honest as, honest as best I know how. Please give me some scripture to stand on right now and give me enough strength to make it through the rest of my day. Thank you for revealing how scared I am, and thank you that I can come to you instead of going to the next cubicle and talking about Denise to Debbie because she hates her too. <laughs> Because that's what I would prefer to do right now. <laughs> I'm giving you a mustard seed's worth of faith because that's all I got. I praise you because this little act of faith makes you happy. And you long to help me and I choose to let you. Could that be a real prayer? Yes, yes I think it's a good one. I mean, has anybody else ever felt that way? And to be honest and just say, I'm jealous hates her. She's got a cute little butt and, you know. So, 
So I, I want us to understand how practical we can be with God. That may sound just like, oh, that's heretical. It's not. We can't take, when we take ourself into God and go, Lord, thank you for this job and all that, when you're hating it the whole, I mean, he just can't help us if we just don't get honest with him and tell him how we feel. He can help us. All right, so what if I just won't humble myself and, and have those real kind of prayers? Because there have been times in my life that I would have if I'd have known. I, at times, don't have enough sense to know because it's so deeply embedded in my DNA that I don't even understand I'm walking in pride. It's just me, and I don't know what I'm doing. How does God help us then? And I tried to think of a way that we could relate to as moms about how it can be kind to kill this in us. So this was what uh, hopefully God gave, up, gave to me. What if you had an 18-month-old child that was um, diagnosed with an aggressive cancer? I, I believe this is what God try, has to do with us sometimes. You can't communicate what's happening to that baby as you take them to get needles stuck in them, horrible medicine poured into their little bodies, sickness afterwards, nausea, all the stuff that you have to go through with cancer. Would you enjoy a single moment of what's happening to them? No. You would trade places if you could. Why are you allowing something awful in their little lives since you could prevent it? Because you're trying to kill what is killing them. It feels to the child like you're killing them, but that's the farthest thing from your mind. You're devastated and only want the nightmare to be over. They can't understand, so they beg you to stop, and you can't. You cuddle them, you love them through the whole thing, but they can't understand you. You cry, but you keep taking them to the treatments over and over again. You're trying to set them free from sickness so they can enjoy the freedom of physical health and live a long and beautiful life. That's what God is trying to do for each and every one of us. We have something worse than cancer in each of us, and God sees every black tumor of hidden pride in all of us. This is a universal problem. The chemotherapy for pride is humility. God will administer humiliation if we won't do this willingly. It says pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings honor. His love demands it. He wouldn't be good if he left that inside of us. A parent that stopped taking that child to get treatments may do what satisfies the child at that time, but it wouldn't be loving. Absolutely not. And I thought of this in my own life with Becca and Scott. Um, I loved both of them the same. I mean, I don't think I ever showed favoritism. Scott took three years to be a well-behaved, and Becca took eight and some change. A lot of change. Um, but I was determined to deliver Becca from Becca. She was strong-willed and stubborn. And Scott was not. I did not love him more because he was easier. I had to keep many things from Becca because her character was more important to me than her momentary happiness. And Becca wrote a note in high school. She had the boys and her. That was our Christmas present. And I treasure these things more than anything but she wrote this note because I had to be harder on her. I would be like, she just, I can't explain it. She was, <laughs> does anybody have any of those? You know, they, they try to take you down. They do. I'm like, Lord, what did I do? If she'd have been my first. She might have been my last. I don't know. And, and she wrote a note to me and her dad, and she said, Mom and Dad, you taught us how to enjoy the small things in life, the things that really matter and mean the most. You only asked us to do our best. You didn't pressure us or make us be the best. You taught us, and this is the part, you taught us that we are dust balls and not the center of the world. For that, I am forever grateful. And that may sound whatever, but I have, she's one of the happiest young women I've ever known because she does not feel like she's the center of the universe. She did feel like she was the center of the universe for a very long time. <laughs> but was I doing that because I loved her or because I hated her? It was because I loved her and I wanted to kill the things in her that were going to make her life miserable. And God killed both of us a little bit through it. 
So, and I'm going to read something from C.S. Lewis because I can't say it any better than him, and I'm almost done. This is C.S. Lewis, and if anybody ever reads the book Mere Christianity, this is chapter 8, and it's called The Great Sin, and it's talking about pride. And this is the end of the chapter. He said, we must not think of think pride as something God forbids because he is offended at it, or that humility is something he demands as due his own dignity, as if God himself was proud. He is not the least worried about his dignity. The point is, he wants you to know him. He wants to give you himself, and he and you are two of such a kind that if you really get into any kind of touch with him, you will, in fact, be humble, delightedly humble, feeling the infinite relief of having for once got rid of all the silly nonsense about your own dignity, which has made you restless and unhappy all your life. He's trying to make you humble in order to make this moment possible, trying to take off a lot of silly, ugly, fancy dress in which we've all got ourselves up and strutting about like the little idiots we are. He said about himself, I wish I had gotten a bit further with humility myself. If I had, I could probably tell you more about the relief, the comfort of taking off the fancy dress, getting rid of the false self with all of its look at me and aren't I a good boy and all its posing and posturing to get even near it even for a moment, is like a drink of cold water to a man in a desert. Do not imagine if you meet a really humble man that he's what most people call humble. He will not be a sort of greasy, swarmy person who's always telling you that, of course, he's a nobody. Probably all you'll think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility He will not be thinking about himself at all. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that we are proud. And it's a big step too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you're not conceited, it means you're very conceited indeed. So what do we do? I'll tell you what I've done to safeguard my life. I've asked people who love me dearly and they need to love you. Do not ask people to do this that do not love you, okay? Because they'll just be hateful. Okay, I've asked people who love me dearly to tell me when they see pride in me. When they see anything resembling it, I want you to tell me. Love me enough to tell me. And I invited them to tell me. And, And those people know who they are. And your close circle should be people like this that will tell you the truth. Let people in your life that will tell you the truth. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. That's Proverbs 27, 6. Go to people. Ask them to do it. Everyone else can usually see what we cannot. Okay? If you're proud, most people will not ever tell you because you will probably puff up like a puffer fish and defend yourself. So if that's your first reaction, if somebody has a conversation, you need the conversation. Okay? Humble yourself in your heart before God And tell him you struggle with pride and beg him to show you the truth and and to deliver you. This is like, to me, working with a holistic doctor who's keeping an intimate check on you to give you what you need at every turn. Because Jesus is our great and kind physician. He's great and he's kind and he knows us inside out. He even said, well, people don't need a doctor It's the sick that need a doctor. And he came for us because we are. We're sick. And he's the one who heals us. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. He, um, He came to cure the sickness of sin and pride to give us wonderful humility. Has anybody ever heard the scripture, he, by his wounds, we are healed as a scripture to tell you you should never be sick? Okay. Listen to this in 1 Peter. It will take that away. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. Why? By his wounds have we been healed so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's our healing. That is not even talking about a a physical healing. That's 1 Peter 2, 24. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed about pride. This thing was dumped into our soul at birth, and we 
cannot help it. It's what came with our Adam nature. Jesus knows that, and he will fight with us and love us completely throughout the process. Even if we have to go into humiliation because we won't humble ourselves, it's his perfect love that does that. Anyone that's God's child, he says, those I love, I discipline. He's a good father. I didn't discipline every kid on the street. I disciplined my kids. I told y'all that last week. He is going to complete what he started, like I said, like it or not. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, so at the proper time he may exalt you. God longs to raise us up and let people see a beautiful woman full of his glory. And his desire is to get rid of anything and everything that is hurting his children. The joy we would experience if we would quit being obsessed with ourselves is true living. If we knew how big and how loving our God is, honestly, we would immediately put ourselves in the palm of his hand. It's the safest place in the universe, the palm of his hand. We can forget about ourselves, and I want you to hear this. We can forget about ourselves because he never does, not even for a split second, and I can prove it. Isaiah 49, 15, and 16. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? The answer is yes, that can happen. Though she may forget, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. God says about each one of us, he has put our name on the palm of his hands. He will never forget us, not for a second. Even when we feel forgotten, he has not. That's why he had to write it in a book, because we will think he's forgotten. He hasn't. We can humble ourselves under his mighty hand because our names are written there, and that's where we belong. It's where we fit and where he wants to lift us up with that same hand and exalt us and let the world see what a woman of God looks like. He wants to do that with every one of us in this room. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that everything you say in your word, it is never to hurt us. You only wound us in order to heal us. You are never unduly harsh. You want us to come to you and open our scared little hearts and let you tell us the truth to the degree we can even take it in. And then you want to start letting us taste freedom so that when we get that little taste, we will get addicted and that we will say, God, take us anywhere you have to go. Just let me walk in the freedom of humility. In Jesus' name, amen.